Hello again, it's Laura from the End Times Watchman uh, channel and I'm here again with another video and I'm doing a series called Come Up Hither. <laughs> and uh, that uh, phrase uh, is taken from Revelation 11 where the two witnesses having spent three and a half years trying to draw people to the one true God and away from the beast system are eventually killed by that beast. They lie in the streets of the great city <laughs> uh, for uh, three and a half days and those that dwell upon the earth gaze at their bodies and say hallelujah they're finally gone <laughs> and then um, they hear this voice say come up hither and they are brought to their feet and then they are resurrected and so um, as I've explained in other videos I, uh, I for me I believe that that is the point of the first resurrection I believe that the rapture takes place at the same time and that that will happen just before the seventh trumpet is blown and the third woe comes to pass. And uh, we obviously don't want to be on the earth when uh, that seventh trumpet is blown because um, that will not be a very pleasant time for anybody. And it's quite interesting, just, just as a little aside on this, because I think a lot of people get a little bit confused. I think they have this idea that when the wrath of God is poured out that everybody on the planet is going to die. Um, but that isn't actually, I don't believe what the Bible says. Um, I believe that the Bible indicates that the world will take a serious pummeling, that there will be a lot of people who die, that there will be um, people who had the mark of the beast who will really, really suffer in that time. And, um, and then I also, but I believe that there will still be at the end of that, that when the Battle of Armageddon comes, I mean, there's obviously people still on the planet then, <laughs> Right, And then obviously um, when the people come back to rule and reign, they're going to be ruling and reigning over somebody. So who are they going to be ruling and reigning over? So there's still going to be people on the planet. So just because um, you're on the earth uh, during the time of the outpouring of the wrath, um, I don't think that necessarily means that you're no longer saved. Um, I've got lots of scriptures that kind of indicate that actually um, that people experience that wrath and then they repent and then they turn to God. Okay, so I think there's a bit of confusion around that. I think that people think, oh, well, if you're there when the wrath is poured out, that's it for you. Um, the only ones that it says for sure um, lose their salvation is those that have the mark of the beast. It doesn't talk about people who don't take the mark as being unsaved and it doesn't necessarily indicate that everybody on the planet dies during the wrath so and, and there's lots of hints otherwise so I hope that maybe just kind of clarifies some things for some people because I think they people think that um, that I'm saying that if you're not raptured um, then that's it for you to hell you go and uh, I don't I think I need to make that clarification that no it doesn't actually have to mean that um, it just means that that you are there to experience the wrath of God and the wrath, you know, is obviously there to say, OK, I do actually exist. And um, you really want to be turning to me because I'm about to come and rule a reign over you. <laughs> You know, it talks about nations if a nation doesn't come to worship. So, you know, people are still able to make free will choices just because Jesus is ruling on the planet. It doesn't mean that everybody is doing what he says. You know, this is what the Bible says. Sorry if that confuses you, but that is what the Bible says. So I think we just need to start um, fine-tuning our understanding of things, okay? So when I say that Christians may still be on the planet when the wrath is being poured out, I am not necessarily saying that they will lose their salvation. I'm not making that statement. I'm simply saying that they are not the true bride, that they are not those who will ascend in the rapture, that they are, that they will experience the wrath, um, but that doesn't mean that they won't have an opportunity to still be saved.
Okay, so I hope that clarifies a bit. Anyway. <laughs> In this series, um, I've just been talking about how I believe that during this time of tribulation, God is offering his people an opportunity, an opportunity to make a choice not to focus on the things of this earth, not to focus on physical realities, not to fall into fear and to just, you know, be trying to do things in our own strength. But actually, he's giving us that opportunity to look up look up for our redemption draws nigh and as we look up we become more and more like him we become more and more filled with his light and his glory and his truth and the power of the holy spirit and that actually by looking up we will be able to radiate that light and glory into this world as it gets increasingly dark and i believe that we will see that we will be ones who will participate in amazing amazing miracles that will demonstrate that our God is real <laughs> and that a lot of people will come into the kingdom as a result of that, but that we need to be looking up. And so that is the call to come up hither. And, um, and then I also uh, am connecting that in with something else that I feel that God showed me in terms of three spiritual disciplines which will empower us to answer that call to come up hither. So this is very practical. And, um, and what's even more exciting is that I think that I can show in the Bible that each one of these disciplines actually represents a mark that when we um, carry out these disciplines, that we become marked as the bride of Christ, as opposed to those who are marked as being with the beast. Okay, now I know which mark I want. I want <laughs> the mark of the bride of Christ. <laughs> I want to be one of the ones who will have the name of God and the name of the city of my God <laughs> and a new name on my forehead. Thank you very much. And I'm sure that each one of you does too. So in a, the previous video, we talked about what I believe is the first spiritual discipline, which is meditating on the law day and night and uh, I'm not going to get into that teaching you just have to watch that video and then the next video that we do will be um, walking in love and acts of sacrificial kindness so as Jesus said if you're truly my disciples you will love one another <laughs> and uh, I'm not going to get into that teaching that's the next one okay but today we're going to be talking about weeping and weeping wailing, sighing and crying about all the abominations that are going on in the temple. And that may sound like it's a very specific call, but actually when you actually unpack it, it becomes quite broad. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. <laughs> right, so key number two <laughs> sigh and cry for the abominations taking place in the temple oh my gosh this word comes from ezekiel 9 starting at verse 4 and as you'll know um, my video about the abomination that causes desolation is all based on ezekiel 8 where the abomination is being set up. But in Ezekiel 9, God is about to unleash his wrath on Jerusalem. And he says to Ezekiel in verse 4, he says, The Lord said unto um, an angel, Go through the midst of the city, the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry cry for all the abominations that are being done in the midst thereof and to the others he said in mine hearing go ye after him through the city and smite in jerusalem Smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity, slay utterly old and young, both maids and the little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. 
And then verse 7, then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts of the temple with the slain. Go. So they went out and began killing throughout the city. That's a pretty intense verse. <laughs> and uh, I do, by the way, make it very clear in the other video that I mentioned to you that this verse is applying to the last days. Absolutely. Revelation 10 and 11. Sighing and crying are prayers that are made by those who've already ascended into heaven. They've already taken their seat in heavenly places. They're already praying into situations from Jesus's perspective at the right hand of the Father. Their heart breaks with the Father to see the abominations that are taking place all around them within the temple, within the bride, within believers. This unity with the heart of the Father marks them as being his true bride who is not appointed to wrath and who is spared from the destruction of God's earthly temple. When people say the bride is not, a poor, poor, is not appointed to wrath, they are absolutely correct. What they're not so correct about is who the true bride is. And that is why we do not want to be deceived. So the prayers of those who are sighing and crying for the abominations that are taking place in the temple, that are that those prayers that are like, coming from the perspective of the Father up in heaven, those are very different, very different from the prayers prayed by those who dwell on the earth. Because earth dwellers are only able to look at situations from their own perspective. They've got this tunnel vision of how does it affect me? How does it affect my loved ones? How does it affect my wider community? <clears throat> they are only concerned about how world events will affect them, and they spend an awful lot of time, <laughs> first of all, telling God about the problem. Oh God, you know, uh, so-and-so happened yesterday, and I just need to lift this situation up to you and tell you all about it, God. <laughs> so they tell God about the problem, as if he wasn't already aware of it, and then they tell him exactly how to sort the situation out. So God, would you have so-and-so do this? And God, would you have this person do that? And would you would you stop, please, this this uh, this person from invading this nation? And, and would you stop, and would you lead, and would you guide? They tell God an awful lot of what he should do, <laughs> according to what they think is the best solution. God lets Ezekiel know in no uncertain terms just how displeasing the prayers of earth dwellers truly are to him. Ezekiel 9 verse 8. So whilst the angels are going out into Jerusalem, killing the inhabitants of Jerusalem who do not have the mark, Ezekiel is left alone with God and he falls face down crying, alas, sovereign Lord. Notice what he calls him. God, you're sovereign. You have the right to do this. You are within your rights to do this to your own people. You are sovereign Lord. Are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of your wrath? On Jerusalem, remember the two witnesses when they are arising and ascending and the remnant are affrighted. There's that word again. And I think that as the bride is rising up, she's looking down at her friends, her family, her loved ones, all those people that she was really hoping and praying were going to be raptured with her. And they're going, God, are you going to destroy all of them? And this is his answer. The sin of the people of Israel and Judah, my people, is exceedingly great. The land is full of bloodshed and the city, my own city, <laughs> that's supposed to look like me, is full of injustice. Now listen to this. They say, 
the earth dwellers say, the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. So I will not look on them with pity or spare them, but I will bring down on their own heads what they have done. Do you see what they say? The Lord has forsaken the land, the Lord does not see. Every time an earth dweller tells God, <laughs> You know, oh God, did you see this invasion happening? Um, could you please, like, you know, tell those nasty people not to invade this country? <laughs> it's like, God, can you not see? Can you not see what's going on? Have you forsaken us, God? Like, hello, can you not see us down here on the earth? That is the prayer of an earth dweller. And that is how you will recognize somebody who is one who dwells on the earth. They, they really offend God by saying that he does not see them or their situation. But because those who sigh and cry over the state of God's church are marked as belonging to the Father, they intently follow Jesus' command to keep watch for the day of the Lord and to be ready for his return at any time. I don't know if you've noticed the people who are like just focused, focused on what's important in their lives. And like, you know, you talk to them, did you know that Jesus is coming soon? And they kind of go, well, nobody knows the day or the hour. Oh, well, we haven't seen this sign and we haven't seen that sign. And well, I'm waiting till so-and-so sign comes and, and then I'll get ready. Have you noticed that that like a lot of people, like even now, are saying that. But the bride, the true bride, no, they're focused on preparing themselves for his return. They are trimming their lamps. They are filling extra jars of oil to ensure that they have enough light to ascend at the rapture. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 24, verse 42, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come, but understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. You know, we might not know the exact day or the exact hour, but we know that we need to be getting ready. <laughs> we know that we need to be getting prepared. We need to be having our to-do lists of like, you know, things that we need to do to be ready for the rapture, <laughs> right? Just like the bride getting ready for her wedding. Now, remember in his letter to the church of Sardis that Jesus warned that he would come on them on his own people, his own bride, as a thief. And that was the word that he used in Matthew 24. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming. So he warns the church of Sardis and he says, I'm going to come on you as a thief. Why? Because they were not being watchful. They were not focusing on strengthening the things of the spirit but were allowing that which they had received to die. These earth-dwelling Christians are way too busy focusing on the physical realm and the things of the world to have time to get ready for Jesus' coming. And when that house comes broken into, it will come as a complete surprise to them. We also see um, after the sixth vial of wrath is poured out and just before the seventh and final vial, Jesus declares in Revelation 16 verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, this has to be a direct warning to the lukewarm Laodicean church of whom Jesus says in his letter that, that to that church, he says, Thou sayest, Laodiceans, I am rich. 
I am increased with goods. I have need of nothing. See how blessed I am. Oh, it's the blessing of God on my life. I am just so rich thanks to his blessing. <laughs> but you don't know that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel thee, Laodiceans, to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that fine linen that is righteousness, that thou mayst be clothed with your garments, the garments. <laughs> you want to have your garments on. You want to have that fine linen of righteousness on when Jesus comes. <laughs> um, that thou mayst be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. This is a warning to the Laodiceans. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayst seest, that you won't be blind. Could it be that the reason why the letter to the Laodiceans is the last letter of the seven, and that it is the letter that follows the Philadelphian letter, could it be that that is because the Laodicean church, the church of earth dwellers, well and truly will be the last church of Jesus Christ to be found on the earth at the time of his second coming and at the time when God's wrath is poured out. Ouch. Luke 21 verse 25. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things that are coming on the earth, right? They're dwelling on the earth. The only thing they can see is what's on the earth. And they see this stuff going on the earth and it puts fear in their hearts. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. You take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. For a snare shall it come on all those that dwell on the face of the earth. Guys, in the days just before Jesus returns and catches up his bride, many Christians' hearts will be full of fear, perplexity, and confusion. Their hearts will be too heavy laden. Their hearts will be heavy with the cares of what's coming on the earth to be able to answer the call to come up hither. To come up hither, they'll go, I hear a voice, but oh, I've just got so many worries, so many things on my mind, so many things on my heart. They won't be able to ascend in the clouds. The thoughts and prayers of earth dwellers will be focused only on what is going on in their particular sphere of influence at work, in their family, or even in their particular church. Instead of looking up to Jesus, I, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? Instead of that, right? the author and the finisher of their faith, their gaze will be 100% transfixed on the horrible things taking place before their eyes on the 24-7 news channel. Guys, really, this is serious. Are you somebody who is just constantly watching the news because you have it in your mind, well, I have to know what's going on so that I can know how to pray? Can I warn you, that is a serious trap of the devil. It is a trap and he's trying to get you to keep your eyes fixed on what's taking place on the earth and you don't. You don't want to have your eyes there. You want to have your eyes what's taking place in heaven. 
rather than being able to discern the glory of God that permeates every aspect of this planet, they will only see darkness and destruction, doom and gloom. Rather than their prayers being concerned with the abominations taking place right under their nose in the temple of God, such as I was trying to tell us in the abomination that causes desolation, you know, with certain medical procedures, right? How many earth dwellers like just poo pooed that? And Laura, that's like so unimportant compared to this plague. Can you not see the plague? Do you see what I mean? Like they weren't concerned about the abomination in the temple. All they could see was the plague. They're so concerned about what's on Twitter, Facebook, and the celebrity magazines, and this will ensure that their attention is distracted and ensnared by the priorities and perverse notions of the pagan nations. Those who understand that the six trumpets are sounding and who are hearkening to the call to come up hither, however, will be following the advice given them in Luke 21, verse 28. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads <gasps> because your redemption is drawing near. <laughs> Rather than our eyes looking down to earth, our eyes have to be looking up to heaven, straining to see the Lord appearing today. <laughs> Luke 21 verse 36, watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Those that are ascending, those that are waiting, those that are coming up hither, they will be praying always, meaning that the name of Jesus will be constantly on their lips. And they will be, they will be praying from the standpoint of heaven. The angels, when you're in the glory of God, when you're in the standpoint of heaven, when you're in, in that great cloud of witnesses looking down on the earth, all you can see is glory. That's all the angels see. Oh, glory, glory. The earth is filled with his glory. Oh, wow. You won't see doom and gloom. You'll only see glory because you've ascended. You've arisen. The day star is in your hearts, guys. <laughs> Those who are sighing and crying, weeping and wailing will be like Jesus. They will only be concerned with only doing the will of the Father during the end times. They will be better able to hear the voice of their good shepherd and to resist any temptation and any trap that the enemy might set before them. If they are called to be martyred during the Great Tribulation, as Revelation 6 tells us will surely happen, they will be strengthened to say, just as Jesus said, Oh God, I wish you would take this cup from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. What did Jesus do just before he went to the cross? He went to the garden, Matthew 26 verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. He went into a place of prayer and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He was weeping. He was wailing. He was sighing. He was crying. They say that blood dripped. That was how tormented he was. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. <laughs> Stay here and keep watch with me. As things get worse and worse, as the abominations get worse and worse and worse, I promise you guys, we will be feeling that pain with Jesus. We will be sorrowful and troubled to the point of death. And Jesus is saying, stay here, keep watch with me, keep watch with me, pray with me, pray with me. 
And um, I could read the rest of those verses, but I want to get to the end, verse 45. <clears throat> then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? But listen to this. Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners, just as many in the bride will be delivered over to the beast. But look at verse 30, 46. Rise! Let us go! <laughs> Here comes my betrayer. Can you see it, guys? He had his, he was full of sorrow. He wasn't looking forward to it, but all he could see was the joy set before him. All he could see was the glory. And because of that, he was able to rise. He was able to go. He was able to ascend and be resurrected. You want to be sighing and crying. You want to be weeping and wailing, not from the perspective of an earth dweller who's like, oh, what was me? No, from somebody who is seeing things from God's perspective, who's able to see the glory, who is in unity with the heart of the Father and can only see the glory. You can only see the glory of what is going on and taking place on the earth. Weeping and wailing, sighing and crying at the abominations that are taking place within the temple, within the holy city of Jerusalem, within the very body of Christ. It will enable you to answer the call to come up hither and to see situations from God's perspective, from his throne room, and not from the very nearsighted perspective of the earth. Sighing and crying will bring your heart into unity with what the Father desires, rather than what you or the unsaved heathen around you desire. And this will be so important as we go forward in the tribulation. Weeping and wailing will also ensure that you are operating within the spiritual realm during these days of great tribulation and that you are operating as someone who is fully baptized with the Holy Spirit rather than focusing only on the physical aspects of the tests and the trials that will be coming upon all those who dwell on the earth. Remember the example of the Apostle John that was given to us in the book of Revelation. The word tells us that even though he was physically exiled, even though he was imprisoned and physically incapable of influencing anything going on in the earth, he chose to be operating in the spirit on the Lord's day. This decision that he made meant that he was able to very clearly hear the voice like a trumpet that was behind him. He was very clearly able to hear that voice. Imagine if he had just spent his time on Patmos, you know, doing whatever his daily tasks were and then just moaning and groaning and saying, oh, I, I'm so, I can't do anything here. What can I do here? Like, you know, this is a complete waste of time. Imagine if he'd taken that approach, but he didn't take that approach. No, he chose to be in the spirit. So when Jesus started speaking to him with that voice like a trumpet, he was able to hear he was able to receive revelation regarding the things that were soon to take place on the earth. And he was really able to respond to that call to come up hither. Remember, there was a voice that said, come up, and up he went. <laughs> Why? Because he was in the spirit. 
He is an example of the Philadelphian church who will, by operating in the spirit, be able to not only see the open door to heaven that no one can shut, but who will be able to go through that door to enter into and engage with the inhabitants of the very throne room of God. And we want to be like him in this period. The lukewarm Laodicean Christians who dwell and focus on the face of the earth and who refuse to engage with the Holy Spirit, whose gaze and prayers are very much earthbound and self-centered, they will be too busy focusing on their daily concerns to hear any trumpets. They will be too busy looking down to see any open doors to heaven even though they could be directly in front of them. They won't see them because their gaze is down. They will be focusing on earthly provision and on their own gold and silver to protect them and to provide for them, even though the Bible very clearly says that these things will prove completely useless in the day of his wrath. They will be operating out of their own minds, their own ideas, their own opinions, rather than seeking to receive an understanding of the full mind of Christ, which only the Holy Spirit can bring. Their ability to bring life to the earth, to be vessels, to be uh, transmitters of life onto the earth, will be diminished as they refuse to connect into the source of all life, <laughs> who is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father. Because Laodicean earth-dwelling Christians never enter into the throne room, they will not be able to be vessels through whom the Lion of Judah can rule and reign and on which the angels can descend and ascend in order to enforce the will of God on the earth. Only the Spirit knows the mind of God and will be able to bring life to the law and the heart of God, which will allow us to operate in the love and the sacrificial acts of kindness. So by weeping and wailing, we actually connect in with the Spirit who will help us with the other two disciplines, okay? I'm not gonna get into those teachings, but weeping and wailing is the connecting, the connecting hallway <laughs> between understanding the law and being able to walk in love. So I pray therefore that you can now understand why in the book of Ezekiel, God commanded that a mark be placed on those who were weeping and wailing, sighing and crying over all the abominations taking place within the temple. The spiritual leaders who had been given the responsibility of ensuring that the temple was kept holy, pure and perfect had turned instead to the abominable worship of false gods and were looking to Babylon. They turned their backs on the altar, <laughs> on the very thing that gave them access to God. No, they were between that altar and the porch and they were facing eastward. They were facing to Babylon. So they were looking to Babylon for their provision and salvation rather than God. That, that represents earth dwelling. People who dwell on the earth look to Babylon, look to the physical. Okay, that's why those spiritual leaders, that's why when God said to put judgment on the temple, he said, begin in my sanctuary. Okay, because these were people who should have known better. But the true bride, the true bride, those who were weeping and wailing, sighing and crying, they were in the city. They were in the holy city of Jerusalem, that heavenly Jerusalem. They were the true bride watching and praying in unity with him, heeding the call to come up hither and conducting spiritual business in the heavenly Jerusalem. So just as they were marked just before the destruction of the temple in Ezekiel's time, 
we want to be marked when just before the wrath is poured out on the earth. But again, <laughs> just with all the other marks, just with all the other disciplines, it is not sufficient, sufficient to just perch down here, to just sit here and just think, oh, I'm up in the spirit realm. Who needs the word of God? Oh, I'm up in the spirit realm. I don't have time to think about the needs of other people. No, 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 no. We need to be working in the other two. It will not be adequate to only have this mark of holiness. Be holy as I am holy, right? The Holy Spirit is holy. He's the one who makes us holy, right? So this mark of holiness is not the only mark that we need on our foreheads when that final trumpet sounds on Rapture Day. Having perfect spiritual vision and hearing and a heavenly perspective is essential. But unless it is used in conjunction with the other two keys, it will only result in becoming someone who is of no earthly use. <laughs> and the point is, is that you are still on the earth, which means he still has plans and purposes for you on the earth. <laughs> Deception is rife, rife <laughs> amongst those who claim to be speaking on behalf of God and yet whose words are not completely aligned with Jesus, who is the entire word of God. Many, many prophets of God have thought that they were entering into the throne room of heaven and engaging with the true angels of God. But I don't know when you hear what they have to say and when you look at their lives, you have to wonder if they have actually been intercepted intercepted by the deceiving spirits in the air. Did they enter into the throne room or did they become ensnared in the second heaven and as such are interpreting dreams and giving divinations and releasing words which are not from the Holy Spirit at all? They claim that Jesus has told them things that either directly contradict or which are perversions of what he has clearly communicated to us through the entire word of God, okay? Um, their ministries tend to bring attention to themselves or they even put an inordinate amount of attention on the Holy Spirit or on angels rather ensuring that all the glory and honor either go to Jesus or to the Father, right? The Holy Spirit gives glory to Jesus. Jesus gives glory to the Father, okay? Nowhere does it say, I don't believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it says that we are to glorify the Holy Spirit and angels definitely never accept worship from human beings in the Bible. So if you're following somebody who gives a lot of glory, like, like, that's all they talk about is only the Holy Spirit. You never hear them talk about Jesus or the Father. You never really meant hear them quoting the Bible. <laughs> They're always talking about, oh, I had this dream and oh, this angel told me this. I'm not saying that those are false prophets. I'm just saying be very, 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 very careful and check out everything that they say with the word of God to the law and to the testimony. And unless somebody speaks according to the law and to the testimony, there is no light in them, okay? And just to clarify, again, I'm not talking about people who are speaking truth and they might not be on the plumb line, but they're still speaking truth, okay? I'm not talking about those being false prophets. Those people are operating in the revelation that they have, okay? And so, as long as it's based on the Bible, okay, their interpretation might not be quite correct. It may not be the full counsel of God, but that doesn't mean that they're the false prophets that I'm talking about here, okay? I'm talking about people who are no longer really anywhere on that spectrum. They've like fallen off. <laughs> they're like over here, <laughs> or they're under here, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking, they've gone completely off the wall. <laughs> okay. You don't want to have anything to do with them. 
really, really, really not. So be very careful about that. <laughs> okay, so where was I? The key of love is often sadly missing in ministries which are more intent on pacifying the itching ears of their listeners or procuring the blessings of God for personal gain than on reaching out to others with the gospel or even meeting the needs of non-members, okay? So if you've got, uh, if you're following somebody and they seem to be like their favorite topic, <laughs> or they're always like six or five, seven times in a meeting asking for an offering, and like none of their focus is at, on the outside world, they're not sharing the gospel, they're not, um, they're not, doing any sort of uh, ministry to help um, disadvantaged people. You know, there's no outward, outward works, outward sort of caring about the outside community. If that's the case, then again, that's, um, that's uh, a ministry which is not operating in all three keys. And we need all three keys <laughs> to be the true bride of Christ. So just bear that in mind. So operating in this area um, without the other two can in itself lead to deceptions, okay? You want to make sure that when you're weeping and wailing, sighing and crying, that whatever you are praying really lines up with the Word of God. Otherwise, you could be falling into deception or actually praying things which are contrary to the will of God. And, you know, you shouldn't expect that God's going to answer those prayers. <laughs> the only one that might answer those prayers is your enemy and you really don't want to be giving him any more arsenal. <laughs> so yeah, just, just focus on the word. Um, and if you're not rooted and grounded in love and backing up your prayers with acts of kindness, then pride can really set in. You know, you might believe that you're floating on the clouds in your prayers and you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father, I've been in the very throne room, <gasps> then for sure I'm the bride. <laughs> But if that's not balanced with love for other people, um, then you, you might think that you have the approval of God, but that it's okay to be mean and nasty and selfish to people on the occasions that you come back down to earth. So those are the pitfalls that we can fall into. And, um, and I just pray that you will have the wisdom to avoid those pitfalls as you actively seek out these other disciplines, okay? All of us are going to um, major in at least one of these, if not two of them. So as I go through these videos, I just pray that you will just a little, do a little self-assessment and say, okay, I'm ace on that one. I'm um, yeah, not bad on that one. That one really sucks. <laughs> so now you know where to put your efforts, where to put your, your focus. You know, it's like, okay, I really need to sort out that that area, whichever one it is. Okay, so there you go. So there was the second key. I pray that that video really blessed you. And um, we'll, the next video, as I say, we'll talk about the third spiritual discipline, the third mark of the true bride, which is walking in love and sacrificial acts of kindness. So I look forward to seeing you in that video. God bless. Bye-bye.